when I saw these numbers, I was first like, that's so crazy. Like, it's unimaginable, actually. But then I was like, period. Like, that is exactly what it looks like to walk and move in the power of the Lord. The situation might look not only incredibly embarrassing, but also very much so delusional. And it'll have people looking at you with a kind of pity like, yikes, like someone should tell them to quit while they're ahead, right? But that's exactly when God steps in to fight on our behalf and win the battle for us and make everyone who ever doubted or pitied us to look on in disbelief, okay? Hey everyone and welcome in. My name is Tulu and on this channel I make faith-based videos to encourage you as you fight the good fight of the faith daily. Today I really want to encourage somebody, okay? I want to encourage y'all with a story that I read recently in the Old Testament that not only encouraged me, but reminded me of the fact that we serve a God whose power is truly made perfect in our weakness, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, okay? So let's go ahead and jump right in. So the story today is found in Judges chapter 7, and it involves a man named Gideon and a very large and powerful tribe of people called the Midianites, okay? To give a brief background of what's going on at this time, right? So God has just brought his people, the chosen people of Israel, into the promised land, okay? This is the land that he promised to give them over 400 years prior. He promised to give it to their father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? He brings them into this land, right? And as he's bringing them into the land, the first thing he does is reestablishes his covenant with them, okay? And he is basically doing this to make sure that they're both on the same page regarding allegiance and loyalty towards one another. He wants to make sure that the Israelites are committed to him and him alone and won't be stepping out to serve any gods that they might encounter from the people that were previously living in the land. Now the people of Israel, they respond to God and they're like, God, like, of course, we got you. We are completely sold out, we're committed to you. Like we can't even, we can't even fathom or imagine stepping out to serve other gods, right? Spoiler alert, they do multiple times. And as we enter into the book of Judges, we are basically entering into this chaotic and toxic cycle of the people of Israel stepping out to serve other gods and God responding to this by doing what he promised that he would do, which is giving them into the hands of their enemies, okay? So they have to endure being under their enemy's rule for quite some time, but after they suffer a little bit, they realize the error of their ways and decide to turn back to God and repent, and God graciously has mercy on them and ends up sending judges whose job is to essentially deliver them out of the hand of their enemies, okay? I hope that all made sense. So this is the part of the story where we meet Gideon, okay? He is one of the many judges that God sends to deliver the people of Israel from the hands of their enemies. And at this time, their enemies are the Midianites. Starting off, even the way that we're introduced to Gideon and the things that we learn about him speak so much to the topic of this video. And y'all can read more about this in Judges chapter 6, right? But essentially, Gideon is a man who's kind of cowardly. He doesn't have much confidence. And during our first introduction to him, he is hiding from the Midianites, the people that he will soon conquer. He's hiding from them in a place where wine is made in order to prepare his wheat, okay? It's very, it's very strange. It's very strange. He's very scared. But this is exactly the person that God chose to go up against and defeat this powerful tribe. There's more in there about how Gideon was very doubtful and scared and had to ask God for three signs before he felt comfortable to go, but I'm gonna skip that part for now, okay? Now we find ourselves in chapter seven when it's time for Gideon to respond to the call and go defeat the Midianites. Let's start in verse one. It says, Then Gideon and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped at the springs of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned 
and 10,000 remained. At this part, I literally wrote scaredy cats in my Bible because that was too funny to me. Like 22,000 people is crazy. Verse four, it says, and the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. And anyone to whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who lapped the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set him by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of the people who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Okay, so right off the bat, right? God tells Gideon, you have way too many people with you. I need you to send some of these guys home because with the way it's currently set up, like when y'all win the battle, you're gonna think it's because of you, okay? But I'm gonna move in such a way where the victory could have only happened because of me. So he sends two thirds of them away, okay, scared cats. Next, the selection of the men at the water also really stood out to me because even the way God described them as men who are gonna lap the water like a dog laps water, it, it was just giving like, these are probably not the men that I would wanna go fight with me in the battle. You know, I would probably have chosen the other group, right? But again, this is exactly the group of men that God decides to choose to accompany Gideon to go and defeat the Midianites. The more we keep reading in this chapter and the next chapter, we find out that these men aren't even given any type of machinery or weaponry to help them in the battle. Do you wanna know what they're given? trumpets okay trumpets and jars i said what not trumpets and jars like what is that literally gonna do to help them as we keep reading though we see exactly how god intended to take the full glory for this battle look at what it says in verse 22 it says when they blew the 300 trumpets the lord said every man sword against his comrade and against all the army and the army fled as far as beth Shitta towards Zerara, as far as the border of Abel Mehola by Tabith. God used this measly army of 300 men with nothing but trumpets and jars to have this powerful army of the Midianites turning against themselves, making war against themselves, essentially causing them to self-destruct. We later find out in the next chapter that it was 120,000 men from the side of the Midianites that died in that battle. But you want to know how many died from the side of the 300 men? Zero. Zero. I said, wow. When I saw these numbers, I was first like, that's so crazy. Like, it's unimaginable, actually. But then I was like, period. Like, that is exactly what it looks like to walk and move in the power of the Lord. The situation might look not only incredibly embarrassing, but also very much so delusional. And it'll have people looking at you with a kind of pity like, yikes like someone should tell them to quit while they're ahead right but that's exactly when god steps in to fight on our behalf and win the battle for us and make everyone who ever doubted or pitied us to look on in disbelief okay one thing about god he does not allow his children to ever feel ashamed okay in any circumstance and this story in Judges 7 was the perfect depiction of that for me. I don't know who needed to hear this story today, but I truly hope that it encouraged anyone who feels like they are facing a battle that seems 400 times their size with no real means of fighting and no clue like how they can ever come out victorious. It is exactly in these moments of our lives that God loves to move in because when and not if, when, we do come out victorious on the other side, the only thing that we'll be able to say is glory be to God. So let's not try to hustle and strive and get stronger in an effort to, you know, increase our chances of winning the battle, but rather, you know, when we're in these moments of weakness, let's lean fully on God to be our strength, okay? Please let me know in the comments if and how you've ever seen God step into a situation of your life and win a battle that you couldn't even have dreamed of winning 
with none of your help, okay? I'm sure it'll really encourage not only me, but others who might read it as well. And until next time, let's keep fighting the good fight of the faith, and I'll see y'all in my next video. Bye.